In October 1943, the Second World War was in full swing and the tide was turning against the Axis powers. Though there was no major military breakthrough yet. In Ankara, Turkey, the British Embassy turned out to be a major source of leakage of a secret information. The information was sensitive to the degree that it would have seriously harmed the Allied war effort. The Brits could never really figure out who the leak was, however. And on the German side, well, they didn't even realize their spies supplied them with extremely sensitive intelligence until it was too late. During the middle of the Second World War, October 1943, the wife of the German First Secretary in Turkey phoned Ludwig Karl Moisic. Moisic was the chief of Nazi Germany's intelligence branch of the SS, the Sicherheitsdienst, in Turkey's capital, Ankara. A stranger had presented himself to the wife of the First Secretary, Frau Janke, and now wanted to speak to a person high up in the hierarchy of German intelligence. He said he had crucial information. Within two hours, Moisic reached the German embassy. He was greeted by a man wearing a suit, speaking rather poor French. He referred to himself as Pierre. Against a decent sum of British pounds, he said, he'd be willing to hand over top secret British documents about the war on microfilm tapes. 10,000 pounds per film roll, no less. A considerable sum of money, Moisic had to request the approval of Franz von Papen, the German ambassador in Turkey. Three days later, our supposedly French Pierre returned to the German embassy in Ankara, where Moisic and he exchanged a roll of film for 10,000 British pounds. Now, this was the moment of truth for the Germans. I mean, they got scammed, there was nothing on that film roll. Well, try explaining that to Berlin. It took several hours to develop the film roll. It contained 52 enlargements, after all. And once the films were developed, Moisic realized the intelligence was top quality. It didn't just show documents pertaining to the Stalin's anger and frustration at the lack of support from the US and UK. After all, D-Day would not occur until next year. But the documents also showed how weak the Allied powers were in Italy. Just three months before, the fascist regime in Italy had fallen and Mussolini was placed under arrest. Just one month before, Otto Skorzeny and his elite Fallschirmjäger had rescued Mussolini in one of the most daring operations of the war. And Mussolini set up the Italian Social Republic after his rescue. Our pure sure was right about the dire situation of the Allied powers in Italy and Stalin's frustration. He wasn't referred to as Pierre anymore though. Franz von Papen, very impressed by the quality of the documents supplied to him, now named his invaluable asset Cicero, after the eloquent Roman philosopher. Realizing the golden ticket that had presented itself on a silver platter, the Germans now provided Moisic 200,000 British pounds to pay for intelligence Cicero provided. Thing is, the Nazi apparatus wasn't the well-oiled machine people often make it out to be. It too suffered from internal struggles and bureaucratic frustration. After Sicherheitsdienst head Reinhard Heydrich was assassinated in Czechoslovakia in 1942, his successor, Ernst Kaltenbrunner, took over. When Kaltenbrunner was informed about this supposed Turkish spy with grade A intelligence, he didn't trust it one bit. He summoned Moisic to Berlin wanting to talk to him in person. Traveling by train from Istanbul to Sofia, where he took an airplane to Berlin, Moisic left his post in Ankara for two weeks. When he met Colton Brunner, the latter let there be no doubt. Joachim von Ribbentrop, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Nazi Germany, was convinced Cicero was a mole for the Brits. Since this was their belief, they had not acted on nor made note of the intelligence supplied to them by Moisic. When Moisic, understandably frustrated, returned to Ankara and met up with von Papen, he was equally furious. Von Papen blamed the gossip mongers in Berlin that could not keep quiet about their valuable asset. Nevertheless, the two men continued to receive intel from Cicero and paid lofty sums of often forged British pounds for it. So curiosity started to get the best of the Germans. Why did Cicero help them? When asked, Cicero promptly revealed his motivation. Originally an Albanian, his father had been shot by an Englishman during a hunting party. The family did not receive an apology after his death, much less compensation. Cicero stated that the British ambassador, Sir Yu Bknachbul Yujusen, was a decent man. His subordinates, however, treated the Turkish people working for them very poorly. 
Provided this new information about their spy, the SD was hoping to find out the actual identity of Cicero. They wouldn't, at least not before the end of the war. His name was Eliezer Bazna, who was married, living in Istanbul, together with his family. He was an ethnic Turk of a well-to-do father. They lived in Albania, and when they became independent, they were expelled, losing all their property. He now had to take a job as a butler for wealthy families, and eventually was introduced at the Yanka household. It was a job he didn't hold for long. Eliezer was caught searching through private papers, no doubt, in order to turn a quick profit on them. Next, he worked at the American Embassy in Turkey, until he was hired by the British Legation Secretary. He'd end up working for Sir Yu, the British Ambassador in Turkey. Though he liked Yu as a person, he unearthed a vast amount of secret documents, took photographs with his Leica, and sold them to the Germans and Soviets. Yeah, whoever bit the most. His motivation was purely based on greed. It turned out his father hadn't even died during a hunting accident, but of old age, safe and sound in his bed back in Turkey. His spying left him with a small fortune, even though most of the pound bills he was paid were forged by the Germans. The British never managed to establish who Cicero was up until after the war either. At least, the Cicero papers released by the United Kingdom, Foreign and Commonwealth Office released in 2005 show that. It was not until after the interrogation of Moisej, who was arrested near the end of the war, that the Brits received the German pieces of the puzzle as to who Cicero was. Anyway, for now, the war was still waging over Europe and Turkey was not excluded, although the country officially retained a neutral status. Over time, Cicero provided more camera rolls containing sensitive information of the Allies, rendering him richer by the day. The richer he got, the more confident he got as well. Two months after he had met Moisej for the first time, December 1943, he delivered his most notable piece of intelligence, an entire account of the Allied Summit Conference in Tehran. Even unbeknownst to the Nazis, intel that proved the fact that President Ismet Inonu had attended. Turkey, a neutral country from the beginning of the war, was starting to show which side it was planning to be on, and it wasn't the German side. The British slowly started to catch on though. There was a serious intelligence leak in Turkey, and they eventually managed to pin it down to Ankara. Everyone was suspect, even people with lower functions such as butlers. Late in December, Moisej and Cicero had another meeting, but they realized they were being shadowed by a car. An able driver, Moisej managed to shake off the driver after a reckless pursuit through Ankara. Several days later, a Turkish police official that knew Moisej came up to him and said his driving was rather reckless. Turns out it had been the Turks that pursued them, not the British SIS. At any rate, it was during this time the end of Cicero was slowly coming closer. Multiple factors played a role in this. To begin with, Moisej hired a woman named Elizabeth as his personal secretary. She was the daughter of a German military attaché and seemed a decent secretary. Hiring her would be one of Moisej's poorer decisions during the war, but we'll get to that. Because first there had been a tip-off from the Office of Strategic Services, the predecessor of the CIA. George Wood, the cover of Fritz Kolbe, a German diplomat that became a spy against the Nazis, notified the OSS about a mole in the British Embassy. Well, next thing you know, the British Foreign Office sends a team dedicated to amping up the security around their embassy in Ankara. Even though Cicero was not yet suspect, collecting intelligence became much more difficult since literally everyone was aware of a mole inside the premise. Cicero became way less valuable to the Germans. At exactly this moment, Ribbentrop and Kaltenbrunner realized Cicero's material was genuine and crucial for the war effort. Bit of poor timing. A few months later, in February 1944, Cicero once again tried to collect intelligence, hoping that the extreme crackdown on a supposed mole had faded. Well, the only intelligence he could steal and pass to the Germans was extremely poor quality. It was poor to the degree that Moisej refused to pay him the promised £10,000. In total, by this time, Cicero had delivered hundreds of highly sensitive documents to the Germans, and in return, he had received over £300,000. British pounds. Obviously, a sizable amount of these bills were forged, 260000 to be exact. But still. Okay, so to get to back to Elizabeth, the newly attained secretary to the German embassy, now, rumor had it that Elizabeth at night would creep to Moisich's office and copy sensitive German documents. Moisich had entrusted her with the key to his safe, and one night, as he couldn't sleep, he went to his office only to discover Elizabeth hastily copying documents on her typewriter 
with the key still in the lock of the safe. Now, generally a situation such as this one should arouse suspicion, but Moisich instead requested the key back, upon which Elizabeth threw a fit stating he didn't trust her. Moisich made up with her by taking her shopping, and as they were shopping, they ran into Cicero. Obviously Elizabeth didn't know about Cicero's function and Moisich's connection, but still. Moisich, for some inexplicable reason, did not suspect Elizabeth was a double agent. And if he didn't get the memo, she definitely was. A month later, Elizabeth failed to show up to work several times. Moisich turned up to her apartment and found it empty. No Elizabeth, no items, no nothing. The girl was gone, and despite Moisich's attempt to contact her, he never heard from her again. A week or so after her disappearance, he received a phone call, with a British voice on the other side, attempting to get him to join the British cause. Angry and offended, he refused. It would be two more weeks until Turkey, heavily pressured by the Allies, declared war on the Axis powers. Moisich ended up in a British internment camp. It was there he revealed all about Cicero's activities to the SIS. The Brits received the German pieces of the puzzle, yet they could not pin down who exactly Cicero was. It took until 1962 until the world got the story from the man himself. In 1962, Eliezer Bosna published the novel I Was Cicero, elaborating on his role during the Second World War. And guess what? He had been in prison for several years after the war for using counterfeit money to start up a business. Not the way you'd expect this spy to get caught. A movie from 1952 called Five Fingers is based on Cicero's life. The film is based on Moisich's book. Moisich had written a book about the affair after his imprisonment titled Der Fall Cicero, or Operation Cicero. At any rate, Oyesa Bosna passed away in 1970, largely forgotten after the war, working odd jobs. That's how arguably one of the most valuable assets of the Germans during the war lived and died. Thank you for watching this video, and what is a person or event from the Second World War that you would like to know more about and perhaps see a video of? Let me know your thoughts in the comments, and if you enjoyed this video, consider subscribing to my channel. See you next time.